Hi everybody, how are you? I've just realised that I've been talking to my computer, but not to you. Hi, I am actually here. I am actually streaming. I forgot to do my intro for the stream part because I forgot to hit the start streaming button. I'm here. Hi, how are you? Hope you're well wherever you are. And if you're not, hopefully we can provide you some entertainment today. Hmm. Oh my goodness. The things. I've already told my computer but not you that I had to sort out why my microphone wasn't working and it wasn't my usual thing it's because my computer had done a major update and so therefore it needed to have the microphone unplugged and plugged back in again before it would work. Anyway such is the way of really high-tech things. <sighs> Right, um, I'm trying to think what else, yeah my, my discord, no not my discord but the other discord knows that I'm reading, I don't know why my one doesn't, it should do, strange, I'll have to sort that one out some other time, um, my chat is able to be used as far as I know. I'll just have another look at that. Yes, it's not in subscribers only mode, so that's good. I actually forgot to put it on last time after we finished the stream. That's okay. Um, so you can chat away, so that's good. Uh, mm, 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 mm. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of all the things I'm meant to be doing that I'd forgotten about doing. Um, I have checked that my phone is muted. I have checked that my headphones are muted. If I'd had my phone on my stream, I would have seen that I wasn't coming through. Anyway, it doesn't matter, we're here. That's okay. I did put through an Instagram post, so that's good. I will actually, for those of you who haven't seen it before, I do post when I remember to or when I'm not too busy. I try to, sorry, she knows. I try to post on Instagram that I'm going to be going live sometime in the next hour or so. So see if that linked worked yes it's Twitter and Instagram links for you so there you go <sighs> right I'm just looking in my coffee cup to see if I've got very much I may need to get somebody to have another one for me don't tell them yet they might know and they're coming back No, can't think of anything else. I should probably just introduce myself for those of you who are new here. That works, I suppose. Oh, yes, I know what else is new. We now have our um, Twitch team live for Codex. There you go. Um, there's a link for it down below on my About page. And that will take you to a page that just has a little statement about who Codex is. And then on that page, you can see... All of our uh, Twitch streamers, although not all of them are actually on the list yet, but they will be soon. Um, and whether they're live or not, you'll be able to go to whoever's the next one that's live on our Codex group. Um, I've kept my our Discord server link on my own page for the, the Discord server link for Codex. And I shall give it to you here as well when I get the right place to type. There you go um, and the reason why I've got that there is because I've actually got the link for the, the Twitch page as well if you want for the Twitch team the the Codex Discord server link is is here still on my page so that if you do want to join the Codex Discord server you you are welcome to it's not just for readers it's for anyone who's interested in books and reading and all that sort of stuff we get into all sorts of conversations about things book club is starting up again next month and there may be a change of time of day and day of or day of week that it's on so it will be more possible to include those of us who are not in the north american time zones um but we'll just wait and see how that goes because i don't even know what we're going to be reading yet although i have been asked if i can make some suggestions at some stage for things that i would be happily um, involved with for um, book club discussions just because my channel is a family friendly channel it's a cozy family friendly channel the language is nil and um we don't really get into anything that's particularly harsh 
I used to say it was a G, but it's actually probably more rated PG because of the content of some of the books. And the reason for that is because I don't censor the books. I read the books as they're written. Um, and if necessary, we will discuss the odd thing that's in there, which is um, because of the book being as old as it is, the attitudes being what they were at the time that the book was written. And you do have authors who were aware that certain attitudes in their day and age were inappropriate. And so often they would write to address that to a certain extent, but not so much that they would alienate their potential readers. Um, so they were actually being a little bit subversive in their own way to bring about change, because if you can internalize a, a new attitude that is a positive attitude and it becomes part of you, then you become part of the change. You actually help to change the society around you. Uh, but if you, um, if an author is too accusatory about, accusatory, accusatory, whatever, let's just give you the link for that, um, is too accusing of the society around them then those who are reading who feel like they are already part of that society just will not connect with what the author is writing and so they'll brush it off and they won't learn from it so rather than alienate them a lot of the authors who were bringing about change did so more subtly uh, so that can be where they would address something in a way that started off as being typical and then just sort of changed a little uh, such as gender roles in one of the Edith Nesbitt books um, there was a reference to the, there were two boys and two girls in the family the boys going off and doing something like gentlemen did and the girls doing the, the food and the dishes and things like that um, and I remember thinking at the time I was reading it that they wouldn't get away with that these days later on in the same chapter the boys decided that they were getting bored with just sitting around being gentlemen while the women were off doing the work. And so they came and they helped with the dishes, they helped with the food preparation and felt much more satisfied with being able to be involved. So the author herself, in the way she wrote, did actually start to put into children's minds the possibility of doing things a little differently to what current society at the time said was, was the approved way of doing it. So from that point of view, I don't tend to um, censor what I'm reading. There are one or two words I do not use that are in, in books that I read. I, I just no, don't need to say that word because it is just too strongly inappropriate um, for everybody. And so therefore I don't use that word or those words. Um, and no, I don't need to tell you what those words are. But other than that, Generally, I don't actually comment on the type of words that are used in books. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can find what the link was. I've got a little link here somewhere. I thought I did. Oh, disclaimer. There you go. So you can see just our attitude in general towards words. Um, we can learn from, from things of the past. Not everything from the past is great. Not everything from the past is bad though either. And so therefore I have decided that I am going to be part of bringing about an awareness of that fact that things from the past can be good and can be bad. Just like things from now can be good and they can be bad. And we can bring about change to do with our attitude to life and those around us. Good to see you Blue, great that you're here. Um, I was going to say something else about that I think and no you were not a distraction to that, that's just my brain going off on a tangent. Um, I, de I describe my brain as being um, a little bit strange at times I suppose. Oh, yes and no, uh, it's more it gets easily distracted, um, I have to admit, to being probably on the ADHD scale of things and also on the autism scale of things. And so therefore I have this wonderful package of functions with that, that, my, that my brain works within that are not typical for everybody else, but it means that um, I have abilities that are very easy for me in terms of perception of things, being able to see patterns and extrapolate um, what 
what the implications of those can be instead of just within a narrow confine um, and all that sort of stuff which is just normal for me and it's very normal within my family uh, but when I was working it was I recognized that it wasn't actually quite so typical because the others are sort of like how did you come up with that solution it's a fabulous solution but we would have never come up with that and it's just the way my <laughs> brain works <laughs> yes Jonathan please do buy the shirt that says the past was the worst <laughs> do it <laughs> great to have you here by the way um, right I'm just trying to think I'm just trying to think. I'm sure there was something else I was going to tell you about. All of that sort of general random stuff. And I can't remember what it was. I've now got somebody whistling downstairs because they've forgotten that I'm reading because today is Friday and it's reading time. <laughs> do put up a picture of it if you do get it. And you can be wearing it. You don't have to just put the picture up of the T-shirt. I mean, it'd be great to share it. So that would be lovely. Um, I'll get back over to here, see what's going on there. I'm just keeping an eye on my um, stream background, just seeing what's going on in case there's something I need to know because it is possible to um, have things go awry without you even realising it is, but it's going awry in the background where you can't see it. Awry, that's a lovely word, awry. <laughs> oh dear words lots of fun okay I think I'm ready to get on with the next part of it which is probably telling people who I am now I know that everybody who's currently here at the moment that I can see knows who I am but there are probably going to be people who who watch this later on or who just randomly drop in and they won't and also the people who um, follow me over on YouTube will see this because I transfer the whole thing over to YouTube eventually in about two weeks after I've broadcast and the stuff that goes up onto YouTube will have everything trimmed off outside of the video window and it won't have any um, starting soon screen which this time I won't have to edit off because I totally forgot to actually hit the start soon uh, the start button I put the starting soon thing but I forgot to hit the start streaming button which is why you guys didn't know about me reading until a little bit late today sorry um, anyway so the people on YouTube will also see all this and so therefore it's a great way for them to actually discover instead of having to go right back to the very first video don't you hate that where you have to go back to the very very first episode of something or the first video that somebody's produced for them to even tell you who they are and what's going on and you feel like you've dropped in in the middle of some great big thing that's going on and it's like huh what um help sort of thing so anyway that's that's a big part of why I say hi and explain myself to people who haven't been here before so let's get on with it hi I'm Jeff I read old children's books yes old children's books one such as this one here this one here was given to my my grandmother's brother one of her older brothers um, in yeah, I should know this by now shouldn't I in July 1897 so that's 125 years ago and technically it's an historic book because it's so old but our house has got a whole lot of them they might be mainly in boxes but we do have a whole lot I grew up reading books like that one uh, because they were the books that were there they were the books that my parents had read and that my grandparents had read and they all passed them on to me so I could read them and it was such a, a um a bonus for me which I hadn't realized at the time because it meant that I had an awareness of the world of the way people thought the way people did things from different eras and different parts of the world that others that I was at school with at the time had no clue about they were very much limited in their outlook to just the world around them the world that they were personally experiencing plus what they saw on television uh, which back in, in my day when I was a kid it was only one or two channels and that was it um, so because of that I had this broader outlook I was much more aware of the fact that uh, there are people who live on the other side of the world and when it's daytime for us it's nighttime for them that was normal I understood this as a child because I had relatives who were there we would talk to them on the phone occasionally and they would look out the window and say yes it's dark because it's nighttime 
Um, it's it's winter, but it's a nice still winter at the moment, so therefore I can see the stars really well. Um, even though night time wasn't super late, it was still, because it's winter, dark and clear, because it was nice weather that winter or something like that. Um, and I knew that they were not faking it. You can tell. As a kid, you can tell when someone's faking it, when someone's pulling the wool over your eyes. But you could, t uh, so I could tell they weren't. It was very real. Um, and that sort of fitted in with, with what I was reading in the kids' books. The books were written by people who were living in different eras to what I was living in. Um, and they were living in different parts of the world to what I was living in. Most of them were living in England and Scotland. Um, a little bit in Ireland and Wales, I suppose. I'm not sure. Uh, definitely one or two from Europe, such as the Heidi books. Well, Heidi. Heidi's the only one written by uh, Johanna. Johanna. Um, and other ones like that, but also ones uh, that, that were from Canada and even the States, North America, the general North America, American collective of Canada, States and Mexico. Um, didn't have any Mexican ones, but we had American ones and we had Canadian ones, partly because I have Canadians in my family background and so therefore I would get books from that had been passed on to me from relatives over there. Um, going over and visiting them when I was really, really little. I wasn't at the stage of reading then, but I did have stories read to me. And then later on when I was over there visiting, we were staying in one of the great aunt's houses, one of the great aunts, and she had a whole lot of books which I had never come across before. They were wonderful. Um, so that sort of stuff where you just get an opportunity to experience a world that is outside of what you normally have around you and it just meant so much to me and it's continued to influence the way I see the world and how I interact with the world because I've already got my mind opened up to other places, other people, other things, other times and I think that all of us could do with more of that. So because of that I read old books, there you go and they're lots of fun as long as you can get over the fact that they do view the world a little bit differently. But we can learn from that, so that's good. Um, I do have three tips for those of you who are new here. Um, oh, by the way, I do actually read, at the moment I read three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 3 p.m. New Zealand time. And if you're on Twitch, you will see on my schedule page what day of the week and what time of the day that is for you. It, because Twitch magically changes that to your time zone when you look on, on the schedule page to, to what day that will be for you. So the three tips that I have are drinks, snacks and comfort. So drinks I have always. Sorry, noisy things on my desk. Um, I always have water. And yes, I will shake this at you now, now but that's the reason why I don't actually um, um, drink from this one is because it tips over very, very easily. <laughs> Thank you for joining and, and, and following, Davey. Um, so always have water. It's brilliant for your brain and also for your body. It keeps them both working a lot better than if you don't partake of them. Um, you can also, I'm giving you permission, have other drinks with you when you're listening. Favourite drinks are good, so I've got coffee. Um, if you've got a favourite tipple of some other sort, as long as you are not being too disruptive to everybody around you, especially if you're at the library or somewhere like that, um, engage, enjoy. Um, so this is what I usually drink from just because it's bigger. I won't run out so easily and it won't tip over. So water and, and coffee for me and whatever it is that you like. If you like herbal tea, go and make yourself one while I'm doing my intro. Snacks. Snacks was point number two. So snacks in my treat jar. Yes, there it is with its coffee code on the front which probably doesn't scan for anybody. Um, I should actually put it up on my overlay somewhere for those who are, want to see it. Um, snacks today in my treat jar are digestive biscuits. Now digestive biscuits are English originally. They are a wholemeal flour sweet biscuit and yes I'm aware that some people would call them cookies. We're in New Zealand. They're biscuits. Okay, just trust me. Take this as being part of your 
um, international education if you are not from New Zealand or England. So digestives, Griffin's wheat digestives. And the nearest thing I can come across to what they are, for those who need to understand, um, if they are American, those who are American who need to understand, this is what they look like. Griffin's wheat digestives. They're a little bit like, from what I understand, a graham cracker, or a graham, graham cracker, graham, graham, that's how you say it, the way it's written, not graham. Anyway tough um, graham crackers a little bit like that you know how you use them for s'mores Americans and some Canadians well this is probably we would use digestives for the same purpose if we were to make s'mores which are not a normal thing for us to make I'll just close the packet because it's noisy and get it out of the way because I don't need to eat them all now I shall put it up here by my book I have a lovely book stand which helps me to um, be able to see the words without getting too many um, things falling off my desk. Yes, I thought they were graham crackers when, when I was hearing them mentioned on TV programs and then I would get confused because North American books would call them graham crackers and I'm like, but, but what one is it? And then I found out that it's just the way they talk. <laughs> they do a lot of things like that. Uh, some words Americans put extra vowel sounds into, and other ones they drop them out. Anyway, the, the differences. English, uh, one language divided by, uh, yeah, it's one language divided by two continents, basically, two land masses, uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's drinks, snacks, and comfort today, for comfort, I have my usual purple cushion so I don't actually sit on this but it's a good reminder to get comfortable so that you can enjoy listening to a story okay um comfort yes that's all I need to say on comfort I think I've got my cardigan here if I get cold I don't have it on because usually I actually don't need it I don't get cold when I'm reading I get too warm um I've got my thermals on so it shouldn't be too bad it's winter here of course which kind of goes with the the misty look in the background um, of of my screen, but that's cool. Right, um, there was something else. I was going to tell you something else. What about we just get reading? We don't need to keep talking. Okay, where did we get up to? Last time we had. I think we got to the end of the bit where Dr. Doolittle was looking after the monkeys and they were all well and healthy and happy and Dr. Doolittle was going to head home to England and they, that's right, they had given him the gift of, with its permission, the Push Me Pull You, which was, um, I always thought it was meant to be like a unicorn and a horse, but apparently it's meant to be like a unicorn and a gazelle or an antelope or something. So one head has two little pointy horns and the other one has a single pointy horn. Like, that's what this was for, Uni unicorn headband, as a reminder for me, which I may remember to put on later on. The cat ears at the moment are just because we're do doing animal stories. Um, so the doctor was going to head back to England. The Push Me Pull You had agreed to be a gift for the doctor, and the animals had assured him that it would be well looked after because the doctor was such a lovely man. And... The doctor would then be able to make some money by having people come and visit to see the Push Me Pull You because it was unique. It's the last one in the world or its family was the last in the world or something like that. Very rare and um, European people had not ever been able to catch one because one head was always awake even if the other one was sleeping so you couldn't sneak up on it. Right, so that was where we got to. The doctor was going to head back to England and get settled back in there and all that sort of stuff so we'll eat, read the last uh, paragraph of the last chapter before we get started on the next one then when the party was over the doctor and his pets started out to go back to the seashore and all the monkeys went with him as far as the edge of their country carrying his trunk and bags to see him off end of chapter chapter the 11th chapter which is how it's written in the book actually the 11th chapter 
instead of chapter 11. The Black Prince. Okay. Whatever. We'll see where we go with that. So I'm reading the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting, and this is the 11th chapter, The Black Prince. By the edge of the river, they stopped and said farewell. This took a long time because all those thousands of monkeys wanted to shake John Doolittle by the hand. Afterwards, when the doctor and his pets were going on alone, Polynesia, that's the parrot, said, We must tread softly and talk low as we go through the land of the Jolliginki. If the king should hear us, he will send his soldiers to catch us again, for I am sure he is still very angry over the trick I played on him. What I am wondering, said the doctor, is where we are going to get another boat to go home in. Oh well, perhaps we'll find one lying about on the beach that nobody is using. Never lift your foot till you come to the stile. <laughs> tomorrow, t um, today has enough worries of its own, don't borrow tomorrows, that sort of thing. One day when they were passing through the very thick part, a very thick part of the forest, Chi Chi went ahead of them to look for coconuts. Chi Chi is their monkey, the monkey from their house. And while he was away, the doctor and the rest of the animals, who did not know the jungle paths so well, got lost in the deep wood. They wandered around and around, but could not find their way down to the seashore. Chi Chi, when he could not see them any more, was terribly upset. He climbed high trees and looked out from the top branches to try and see the doctor's high hat. He waved and shouted. He called to all the animals by name, but it was no use. They seemed to have disappeared altogether. Indeed, they had lost their way very badly. They had strayed a long way off the path, and the jungle was so thick with with bushes and creepers and vines that sometimes they could hardly move at all. Um, actually, I should give you a picture for that, shouldn't I? A jigsaw puzzle. Let's give you a jigsaw puzzle. Let's see what one I've got handy. Yep, I think that one will do. There you go. And you should have a link in um, the commands if you wish to do that. I've tried to make it so it's interesting but not too difficult although I'm not too sure about that sky sorry we'll see and I can't even remember what the picture is of we'll find out when you guys do it right um they had strayed a long way off the path and the jungle was so thick with bushes and creepers and vines that sometimes they could hardly move at all and the doctor had to take out his pocket knife and cut his way along they stumbled into wet, boggy places. They got all tangled up in thick, convolvulus runners. Convolvulus is a, um, a type of plant that twists around things, sometimes called bindweed. Convolvulus runners. They scratched themselves on thorns, and twice they nearly lost the medicine bag in the underbrush. <gasps> no! There seemed no end to their troubles, and nowhere could they come upon a path. At last, after blundering from this about like this for many days and getting their clothes torn and their faces covered with mud they walked right into the king's back garden by mistake oh. the king's men came running up at once and caught them but polynesia flew into a tree in the garden without anybody seeing her and hid herself the doctor and the rest were taken before the king ha ha said the king so you are caught again this time you shall not escape Take them all back to the prison and put double locks on the door. This white man shall scrub my kitchen floor for the rest of his life. <laughs> so the doctor and his pets were led back to prison and locked up, and the doctor was told that in the morning he must begin scrubbing the kitchen floor. They were all very unhappy. This is a great nuisance, said the doctor. I really must get back to Puddleby. That poor sailor will think I've stolen his ship if I don't get home soon. I wonder if those hinges are loose. But the door was very strong and firmly locked. There seemed no chance of getting out. Then Gub Gub began to cry again. Gub Gub's the pig, just in case you hadn't remembered. Sorry. Uh, just need to check something over here. No, we're all good. I'm carrying on. Oh, Actually, I'm going to, just going to interrupt myself and give you a shout out because they may not be going, um, saying anything in chat.
Right. Did it work? I think so. I've just given you a shout out for Soft Spoken or Ken. Um, he's one of our Codex readers and you can find the link to the Codex Twitch team, which I don't know if, if um, Ken is actually on the Twitch team yet, but you can ask him about it in chat. Um, but you now got the, the channel link for Ken. Um, if you go to his Twitch channel and follow him, he would I'm, I'm sure he would love it. He also reads um, books, um, public domain books, books that are the sort of books that are put out by Pub Project Gutenberg, which are the public domain ones. Not all of the public domain books in the world, but they are working their way through getting them all digitized and put made available so that people can read them without having to worry about violating anyone's copyright terms. So there you go. Please give Ken a follow. He's a lovely guy. He reads wonderfully. Just encourage him. Go on. Go and do it. Uh, but do come back for the story. If you're on a computer, you can open a tab in, your, in, in the background on your browser. That's a smart way to do it. Anyway, we'll carry on with the story. Um, I'm trying to wear, figure out where I got up to. There seemed to be no chance of getting out. Then Gub Gub began to cry. All this time, Polynesia was still sitting in the tree in the palace garden. She said nothing. She was saying nothing and blinking her eyes. They might just assume she's a normal parrot, I suppose. This was always a very bad sign with Polynesia. Whenever she said nothing and blinked her eyes, it meant that somebody had been making trouble and she was thinking out some way to put things right. People who made trouble for Polynesia or her friends were nearly always sorry for it afterwards. She's a clever parrot. Presently, she spied Chi-Chi swinging through the trees, still looking for the doctor. When Chi-Chi saw her, he came into her tree and asked her what had become of him, the doctor. The doctor and all the animals have been caught by the king's men and locked up again, whispered Polynesia. We lost our way in the jungle and blundered into the palace garden by mistake. But couldn't you guide them? Said, asked Chi-Chi, and he began to scold the parrot for letting them get lost while he was away looking for coconuts. It was all that stupid pig's fault, said Polynesia. He would keep running off the path hunting for ginger roots, and I was kept so busy catching him and bringing him back that I turned to left instead of the right when we reached the swamp. Shh, look, there's Prince Bumpo coming into the garden. He must not see us. Don't move, whatever you do. And there, sure enough, was Prince Bumpo, the king's son, opening the garden gate. He carried a book of fairy tales under his arm. He came strolling down the gravel walk, humming a sad song till he reached a stone seat right under the tree where the parrot and the monkey were hiding. Then he lay down on the seat and began reading the fairy stories to himself. Chi-Chi and Polynesia watched him, keeping very quiet and still. And I think I have a picture for you here illustrations that one there you go there's prince bumpo on the seat in the garden reading the book of fairy tales and the others are up the tree there's polynesia and i think that might be chi chi up there i'm not sure i can't quite tell from the illustration style it's a little bit weird anyway we'll carry on with the next one After a while, the king's son, son laid the book down and sighed a weary sigh. If only, if I were only a white prince. Oh dear, he's reading white people's fairy tales. Oh, here you're going to get one of those old things happening in the story and taken advantage of. Let's just go with the story. This is the way the story was told at the time. Okay? Please don't be offended by it. Just think. They were ignorant, a lot more ignorant about that sort of thing than we are now. <sighs> After a while, the king's son laid the book down and sighed a weary sigh. If I were only a white prince, said he with a dreamy, faraway look in his eyes. Then the parrot, talking in a small, high voice, like a little girl, said aloud, Bumpo, someone might turn thee into a white prince perchance. She's a sneaky one. The king's son started up off the seat and looked all around. 
"'What is this I hear?' he cried. "'Methought the sweet music of a fairy's silver voice rang out from yonder bower. Strange!' "'Worthy prince,' said Polynesia, keeping very still, so Bumpo wouldn't see her. "'Thou sayest winged words of truth, for tis I. Tri "'Sorry, I have to try and get the pronunciation correct. I had prob problems with this one last time. "'Tripsitinka. It is, for tis I, Tripsitinka, the queen of the fairies, that speak to thee. I am hiding in a rosebud. "'Oh, tell me, fairy queen,' cried Bumpo, clasping his hands with joy, "'who is it can turn me white?' In thy father's prison, said the parrot, there lies a famous wizard, John Doolittle by name. Many things he knows of medicine and magic, and mighty deeds has he performed. Yet thy kingly father leaves him languishing long and lingering hours. Go to him, brave Bumpo, secretly, when the sun has set. And behold, thou shalt be made the whitest prince that ever won fair lady. I have said enough. I must now go back to Fairyland. Farewell. Farewell, cried the prince. A thousand thanks. Good Tripsin... Tripsitinka. 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 Farewell, good Tripsitinka. And he sat down on the seat again with a smile upon his face, waiting for the sun to set. And that's the end of that chapter. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? I don't think he has a really wide range of life experience. Do you? Chapter break means it's time for a chat for those who want it and also snacks and drinks. If you didn't get one before, go. Now's your opportunity to go and get one. Also to go off to the loo if you need to. I don't make promises about how long I will be before starting reading again. Sorry, I've got an itchy ear. <laughs> I try not to be an open mouth chewer. We were not allowed to ever when I was a kid. <laughs> Go, Ricky's talking to his mod friend. Yeah, I should probably turn the, the microphone off when I'm chewing. Sorry. Call it ASMR. I'm going to be extra self-conscious about it now, I know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really into the whole, it's a full body experience eating that you're watching. <laughs> it's a little bit off-putting. Sorry about that. And I'm, I'm, I do apologize for anyone who might be offended by me rubbing my nose or itching my ear, but there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. They just suddenly get itchy. And if I don't do something about it, it literally will have me starting to get very unreasonable and very loud about things that are not the sort of thing you want me to be saying. So it's better to just give my nose a rub or my ear a wiggle and then carry on. <laughs> anyway, right. I'm nearly ready to start reading again. So I do hope that you've managed to get your snacks and your drinks ready. Mm hmm. Have you? I'm going to try and finish this coffee because otherwise it will be too late and I won't be allowed to finish it because I will be awake all night. I hate that. I don't mind if I've got something to do and I don't have to do anything the next day and I will I and if I know I'm going to get enough sleep. But I tend to get migraines if I don't get enough sleep, so it's not really a very good winning sort of situation. Mm. Anyway, we'll get there, we'll get there. So has anyone checked out our new, our, 
the new um ah my brain the new codex twitch team those of you who aren't already on it <laughs> oh my goodness there's me on it i forgot about the fact that it would be showing me yeah it works <laughs> that's the idea with having a twitch twitch teams are really cool because you have a list of the different channels that are part of the team so you can click onto those and go to that channel but also yeah i haven't made it uh, um try putting in codex and i think you'll find that it shows you the team link um as well as the discord link um not only do it does a team page show you who is part of the team and usually a tiny 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 little bit of information about what the team is what it represents or what it's about um, but it also shows you who is currently live within that team some teams are huge and some of them are quite small our one hasn't got everybody in it yet who is part of the codex reading group um, but we're getting there <laughs> it takes a little while for us for some people to get themselves sorted out and to get things working properly so yeah if you look at that link that gorehi has just called up by putting in the codex command sorry um i'm just going to read it out for those who need it yes i am a reader in the codex team for more old story readers check out and follow other codex members on our codex twitch team page and then there's the link for that it's actually twitch tv forward slash team forward slash codex it's really easy if you haven't got a link that you can click on that's all it is it's twitch tv forward slash team forward slash codex um, and then also after that i've written and join the codex discord server and i've got the link for that which i'm not going to read out because it's a bunch of letters and number no it's all letters in different cases which are very easy to get wrong you better to actually find the link for that which is also on my about page i have two different links for codex on my about page one is for the twitch team and one is for the codex the codex discord server which is where you can find out about uh, book club movie club which i know nothing about yet and also just get to know the different readers on, on in the twitch um, codex group yeah that's a good idea thank you for adding the alias for the team thing i totally forgot that one hopefully it's gonna work oh it just took a while no that was the codex one i'll have a quick look while we're here i'm just doing some computer housework while you guys watch I wonder if it's because I've actually got that page open on my computer. I'm just going to put it in for you. Don't worry about it. Try that. I think I've added it correctly, so you can have a try of that one now. Yes. I did actually correct a couple of the other shortcuts, that, the, the aliases that my system had, because it had things that didn't need to be, oh, things that were as if they were a whole phrase, when in actual fact they were meant to be three separate things. I'm talking to, to, to Goreki in case anyone's wondering what I'm talking about. But I've finished my biscuit and I've nearly finished my coffee and I'm nearly ready to go back to reading. And I'm still thinking about what other tags I can put on my YouTube, uh, on my Twitch channel to help people find us when we're, they are looking for us reading. Us in general. This is you, me and everyone else who's here doing our reading thing and enjoying it together. So I'm just figuring out what other um, command, uh, tags to put in there. Because I know that others have things like historic. Um, I wouldn't put a country one on this because the book's not set in just one country and it starts to get confusing. Like it's England, it's Africa. It's Puddleby on the Marsh, which is an imag imaginary place, which 
no one's going to type in. All that sort of thing. Anyway, don't forget your drinks of water either. It keeps your brain going and it stops you getting headache, so many headaches. I'm speaking from experience, trust me on that one. Dehydration headaches are not worth it. And it's very, very easy to get dehydrated in winter because you don't want to drink cold water. So give yourself warm water and drink that instead and you'll feel a lot more comfortable. Right, let's get on with reading. So that was, and I unlock my iPad mini. See, I use old tech. This is an iPad mini and it's a first generation one and it still goes. And it even still holds its charge quite well. <coughs> That was chapter 11, we're going to read the 12th chapter. So this is the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting, the 12th chapter, Medicine and Magic. And I just need to find out what that initial is on this chapter. V. Yeah, I haven't actually put together the um, illuminated letters, first letters, I think that's what you call them for um, the book. We'll get there. I'll put them on the Discord server maybe, if I remember. And if I don't remember, you can remind me. Here we go. The twelfth chapter, Medicine and Magic. Very, very quietly, making sure that no one should see her, Polynesia then slipped out at the back of the tree and flew across to the prison. She found Gub Gub poking his nose through the bars of the window, trying to sniff the cooking smells that came from the palace kitchen. She told the pig to bring the doctor to the window because she wanted to speak to him. So Gub Gub went and woke the doctor who was taking a nap. That was one thing that a friend who had been in the military t told me, if you ever get a chance to take a nap, take it. You don't know when you're going to get one next. Um, and yeah, they made sure that they got whatever sleep they could. If you can't do anything about the situation you're in, take a break, take a rest, whatever. As long as you're not actually supposed to be doing something that you can do. Right. Gub Gub went and woke the doctor who was taking a nap. Listen, whispered the parrot when John Doolittle's face appeared. Prince Bumpo is coming here tonight to see you and you've got to find some way to turn him white. But be sure to make him promise you first that he will open the prison door and find a ship for you to cross the sea in. Ooh, that's good thinking, isn't it? I'm sorry if that puzzle's a bit hard. Um... It's always a bit of a challenge to know quite how to, to set it up for a number of puzzle pieces. Um, and find a ship for you to cross the sea in. This is all very well, said the doctor, but it isn't so easy to turn a black man white. You speak as though he were addressed to be re-dyed. It's not so simple. Shall the leopard change his spots or the Ethiopian his skin, you know? I don't know anything about that, said Polynesia impatiently. But you must turn this man white. Think of a way. Think hard. You've got plenty of medicines left in the bag. He'll do anything for you if you change his colour. It's your only chance to get out of prison. Well, I suppose it might be possible, said the doctor. Let me see. And he went over to his medicine bag, murmuring something about liberated chlorine on animal pigment. pigment. Perhaps... Zinc ointment as a temporary measure, spread thick. Well, that night, Prince Bumpo came secretly to the doctor in prison and said to him, White man, I am an unhappy prince. Years ago I went in search of the sleeping beauty whom I had read of in a book, and having travelled through the world many days, I at last found her and kissed the lady very gently to awaken her. As the book said I should, Oh dear, he's taking it as a textbook. Tis true indeed that she awoke, but when she saw my face she cried out, Oh, he's black! And she ran away and wouldn't marry me, but went to sleep again somewhere else. So I came back, full of sadness, to my father's kingdom. Now I hear that you are a wonderful magician and have many powerful potions, so I come to you for help. If you will turn me white so that I may go back to the Sleeping Beauty, I will give you half my kingdom and anything besides that you ask. Prince Bumpo, said the doctor, looking thoughtfully at the bottles in his medicine bag, supposing I made your hair a nice blonde colour, would not that do instead to make you happy? He's obviously got some sort of bleach there in his bag. No, said Bumpo, nothing else will satisfy me. I must be a white prince. 
You know, it is very hard to change the colour of a prince, said the doctor. One of the hardest things a magician can do. You only want your face white, do you not? Yes, that is all, said Bumpo, because I shall, be, I shall wear shining armour and gauntlets of steel like the other white princes and ride on a horse. Must your face be white all over? asked the doctor. Yes, all over, said Bumpo, and I would like my eyes blue too, but I suppose that would be very hard to do. Yes, it would, said the doctor very quickly. Just a moment, I'm just making sure I know where we are up to for the next picture. Yes, it would, said the doctor quickly. Well, I will do what I can for you. You will have to be very patient, though. You know, with some medicines, you can never be very sure. I might have to try two or three times. You have a strong skin, yes? Well, that's all right. Now, come over here by the light. Oh, but before I do anything, you must first go down to the beach and get a ship ready with food in it to take me across the sea. Do not speak a word of this to anyone. And when I have done as you ask, you must let me and all my animals out of prison. Promise by the crown of Jolliginki. So the prince promised and away, went away to get a ship ready at the seashore. When he came back and said that it was done, the doctor asked Dab Dab, that's the duck, to bring a basin. That's a big bowl, a wide bowl that's not usually quite so deep. Uh, when we're on the boat, when, on the boat when I was growing up, the little boat, we used to use a basin for doing the dishes in. Um, so it was a, a, a thing that was around about that big across. Some One of them was rectangular, one was, was round, but it was only about this deep because you didn't need lots of water deep. You just needed enough for the plates to be able to sit in. So that's a basin. There are other things. There are ceramic basins. There are metal ones. Hand basins for washing your hands in. They're usually, the older ones are wider, not deeper. So it's, it's a reference to the sort of shape it is too. When, the doc, um, when he came back and said that it was done, the doctor asked Dab Dab to bring a basin. Then he mixed a lot of medicines in the basin and told Bumpo to dip his face in it. Hmm. The prince leaned down and put his face in right up to the ears. So he put his whole face into it right up to the ears. He held it there a long time, so long that the doctor seemed to get dreadfully anxious and fidgety, standing first on one leg and then on the other, looking at all the bottles he had used for the mix mixture and reading the labels on them again and again. A strong smell filled the prison, like the smell of brown paper burning. I think it's burning the colouring out of his skin, oh dear. At last, the prince lifted his face up out of the basin, breathing very hard, because he'd been holding his breath all this time, and all the animals cried out in surprise. For the prince's face had turned as white as snow, and his eyes, which had been mud-coloured, were a manly grey. That's odd. I'm not going to question the chemistry in this. When Dr. Doolittle lent him a little looking-glass to see himself in, he sang for joy and began dancing around the prison. But the doctor asked him not to make so much noise about it, and when he had closed his medicine bag in a hurry, he told him to open the prison door. Bumpo begged that he might keep the looking-glass, as it was the only one in the kingdom of Jolliginki, and he wanted to look at himself all day long, but the doctor said he needed it to shave with. Then the prince, taking a bunch of copper keys from his pocket, undid the great double locks, and the doctor, with all his animals, ran as fast as they could down to the seashore, while Bumpo leaned against the wall of the empty dungeon, smiling after them, his big face shining like polished ivory, ivory in the light of the moon. When they came to the beach, they saw Polynesia and Chi-Chi waiting for them on the rocks near the ship. I feel sorry about Bumpo, said the doctor. I am afraid that medicine I used will never last. Most likely he will be as black as ever when he wakes up in the morning. That's one reason why I didn't like to leave the mirror with him. But then again, he might stay white. I had never used that mixture before. To tell the truth, I was surprised myself that it worked so well. But I had to do something, didn't I? I couldn't possibly scrub the king's kitchen for the rest of my life. It was such a dirty kitchen. I could see it from the prison window. Well, well. Poor Bumpo. 
Oh, of course he will know we were just joking with them, said the parrot. They had no business to look us up, said Dab Dab, wiggling her tail angrily. We never did them any harm. Serve him right if he does turn black again. I hope it's a dark black. In other words, sort of vengeance for expecting to be different to what he actually is. But he didn't have anything to do with it, said the doctor. It was the king, his father, who had us locked up. It wasn't Bumpo's fault. I wonder if I ought to go back and apologise. Oh well, I'll send him some candy when I get to Puddleby. And who knows, he may stay white after all. The sleeping beauty would never have him, even if he did, said Dab Dab. He looked better the way he was, I thought. That's a good thought. But he, he'll never be anything but ugly, no matter what colour he was made. Obviously, Dab Dab has a particular opinion about what people should look like. Still, he had a good heart, said the doctor. Romantic, of course, but a good heart. After all, handsome is as handsome does. I don't believe the poor chap found the sleeping beauty at all, said Jip the dog. Most likely he kissed some farmer's fat wife who was taking a snooze under an apple tree. Can't blame her for getting scared. I wonder who he'll go and kiss this time. Silly business. Then the push me pull you, the white mouse, gub gub, dab dab, jip and the owl. The owl tutu went on to the ship with the doctor, but Chi Chi, Polynesia and the crocodile stayed behind because Africa was their proper home, the land where they were born. Oh dear. Oh, that's a bit sad. And when the doctor stood upon the boat, he looked over the side across the water, and then he remembered that they had no one with them to guide them back to Puddleby. The wide, wide sea looked terribly big and lonesome in the moon moonlight, and he began to wonder if they would lose their way when they passed out of sight of land. But even while he was wondering, they heard a strange whispering noise high in the air, coming through the night, and the animals all stopped saying goodbye and listened. Mm. The noise grew louder and bigger. It seemed to be coming nearer to them, a sound like the autumn wind blowing through the leaves of a poplar tree, or a great, great rain beating down upon a roof. And Jip, with his nose pointing and his tail quite straight, said, Birds! Millions of them! Flying fast! That's it! And then they all looked and there, streaming across the face of the moon like a huge swarm of tiny ants, they could see thousands and thousands of little birds. Soon the whole sky seemed full of them, and still more kept coming, more and more. There were so many that for a little they covered the whole moon so it could not shine, and the sea grew dark and black like when a storm cloud passes over the sun. And presently all these birds came down close, skimming over the water and the land, and the night sky was left clear above. And the moon shone as before, still never a call, nor a cry, nor a song they made, no sound but this great rustling of feathers, which grew greater now than ever. Then they began to settle on the sands, along the ropes of the ship, anywhere and everywhere except the trees. The doctor could see that they had blue wings and white breasts, and very short feathered legs. As soon as they had all found a place to sit, suddenly there was no noise left anywhere. All was quiet. All was still. And in the silent moonlight, John Doolittle spoke. I had no idea that we had been in Africa so long. It will be nearly summer when we get back home, for these are the swallows going back. Swallows, I thank you for waiting for us. It is. It was very thoughtful of you. Now we need not be afraid that we will lose our way upon the sea. Pull up the anchor and set the sail. And here we have the last picture of the chapter. And I shall move to one side so you can actually I'll make it slightly smaller you can, so you can see it a bit better. When the ship moved out upon the water, those who stayed behind, Chi Chi, Polynesia, and the crocodile, grew terribly sad. For never in their lives had they known anyone they liked so well as Do 
Dr. John Doolittle of Puddleby on the Marsh, and after they had called goodbye to him again and again, they still stood there upon the rocks, crying bitterly and waving till the ship was out of sight. So there's the crocodile, there's Chi Chi the monkey, and I think this is Polynesia the bird, but I can't quite tell because it's not a very clear picture. It's just one of those ones. Those poor animals, That's uh, he has been the centre of their world for so long. And that's the end of that chapter. They're much shorter in this book, aren't they? We will have another chapter, because the next one's even shorter. Hmm. <laughs> so, what else can we talk about in the chapter break? I'm going to have a drink of water. What about you? Hmm. You got the picture finished. Well done. Excellent. Fabulous. Would you like another puzzle? I can do another puzzle for you. I'll use one that I've already got. It's kind of already set up. I've got the link for it. I'm just trying to think of what I need here. I'm looking at the ones that I've got. Oh, that one there. That's right. I'll put another puzzle up that'll give me something to do in the chapter break. Properties, there we go. See, it worked. And that's using a puzzle that's not from that website, but the website is handling it. So how many puzzle pieces do we need? Uh, the last one I think was about 120. I don't think I'll go as, as, as um, I might put it down a little bit. It's all very dark, isn't it? Hmm. I've made it a little bit less pieces, so it should make it a lot easier to do. Because the colours kind of overlap very easily. Which kind of doesn't make sense. Sorry about that. Right. And here we go. I need to put that link in here. No, not that one. This one. Don't type it in yet. Jigsaw. Put the link in here. I think that's the correct one. It should be. Right. Give that a try. If you want to do the puzzle, try the link now. And then I carry on with reading. Let me know if it doesn't work and I'll get it set up again. Right. We're reading the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting and this is the 13th chapter, Red Sails and Blue Wings. Hmm. Interesting. Intriguing. Red Sails and Blue Wings. Sailing homeward, the doctor's ship had to pass the coast of Barbary. Now, Barbary is a real place region was. What about we find out? Oh, go away. I had to clear the link that was previously there. Barbary Coast. The terms Barbary Coast, Barbary, Barbary, spelt slightly differently, and Berber Coast. There's the clue, Berber, the Berber peoples of North Africa, were used in English language sources similarly, similarly to equivalent terms in other languages from the 16th century to the early 19th to refer to the coastal regions of North Africa or Maghreb, specifically the Ottoman borderlands consisting of the regencies of, in Algiers and Tripoli, as well as the Beylik of, of Tunis and the Sultanate of Morocco. The term originates from the name of the Berbers. So it's the North African coast. I might show you this picture here. Let's see. Save this image. I'm going to have to zoom this one down a long way. I know that much. Just have to find the right folder to put it into, and then I shall do so. Let's 
finding the picture, the place to put it. Oh good, it's not quite as big as I thought it was going to be. Right. It's actually effectively it's it's two maps, one above the other. So this is Morocco over here coming up to the Straits of Gibraltar and a little bit of that. And then you have Tunisia here. Um, that I think is Sicily off the end of Italy. And then you've got whatever it is that comes after Tunisia. So this bit here is this bit here. I'm doing a little bit better at my um, weather person hands thing on the map, aren't I? Um, so this is the... That's not Gibraltar. Gibraltar's over here a little bit further. So that's that point there on the coast. And then it comes along here. So this is the Barbary Coast. So that, I think what that means is that they were coming up the coast from down here, up this way, and they were coming past this on the way up to England. Because a little boat like that, in, this, in that day and age, they would have had to stop places to get more food even if it is a, a, a fantasy story, an imaginary story. Right. Uh, I saw an advert on another channel. Two kids are playing a game, but neither's actions match the on-screen movement. <laughs> it's probably video of game, video of children. Let's just slap them together. Nobody will notice the difference. Well, if you're doing ads for people who watch gaming, they're all going to know the difference. <laughs> it's funny sometimes the things like that that happen. Oh, there's a moon. Oh, nice. Sorry if it's a little bit hard. I didn't intend it to be. Right, we'll carry on with the story though. I'm getting that ready for the next time I have a picture to show you as well. <sighs> Sailing home with the doctor's ship had to pass the coast of Barbary. So now we know where it is. That's the North African coast. This coast is the seashore of the Great Desert. That would be the Sahara. Southern Morocco goes into the, there's an er, a disputed area of land which Morocco claims is theirs and the people who live there claim is their own but not, um, not actually. I was going to do it on a map, sorry. I'm just trying to find out what they call it. Western Sahara, that's it. So technically what he's talking about is the Barbary Coast. Is probably not. Um, I'll just see if I can show you this map, a general normal map. Um, make that visible. There's a map. Interact, and then I can show you that one out of the way. That's London. That's from when we had some of the other children in one of um, Edith Nesbitt's books. So here you see, I'll move over so you can see it. Let's just zoom out a bit. So the coast that we saw on that map before was this bit of coast here that's up to the Straits of Gibraltar and then along here. So this is Morocco down here and Algeria. And then over there is Tunisia. I keep forgetting Algeria. So this bit of coast here and this bit of coast down here, that is referred to as the Barbary Coast, traditionally. But it also extends down the Moroccan Atlantic coast, the coast of, of um, Morocco as it's in the Atlantic Sea. I'm just moving this because that's the bit we're going to look at more, really. Um, so I'll do this. So now what he's talking about is... If I zoom out, see how that's got that white area? That white area through here effectively is the Sahara Desert. A lot of that is. I wonder what it would show if I did it this way. Oh, there you go. Desert. So this over here, this is the Sahara Desert and other areas that are desert areas around it. So this is the Barbary, the true Barbary coast is this bit along here, along the top. And then by the sound of it, it said that they, this coast is the seashore of the Great Desert. So that's this bit down here. The um, Western Sahara province is probably what it is actually referring to in the book. 
because often when people are writing books they refer to real things even if it's in an imaginary way they might play with the geography but they might move things around it's called artistic license that's just the way things work right we'll carry on with the actual story part of it so this coast is the seashore of the great desert it is a wild lonely place all sand and stones and it has wild ocean waves and there are people who take a lot of risk to actually go down that coast to go surfing because they want to go somewhere that most people don't go I happen to know this because of book research <laughs> you didn't need to know that but anyway and it was here that the Barbary pirates lived oh they're gonna be in this chapter aren't they these pirates a bad lot of men used to wait for sailors to be shipwrecked on their shores that coast of Morocco lots of shipwrecks because the Atlantic Ocean sorry the Atlantic Ocean crashes in against it uh, and storms drive ships up against it um, off these pirates a bad lot of men used to wait for sailors to be shipwrecked on their shores and often if they saw a boat passing they would come out in their fast sailing ships and chase it when they had caught a boat like this at sea they would steal everything on it and after they had taken the people off they would sink the ship and sail back to Barbary singing songs and feeling proud of the mischief that they had done just a slight aside there's a lot of that sort of piracy still happens but now over on the east coast of northern Africa in the Indian Ocean yes real like the way he described it there and they ransom people if they think they can get money for them and otherwise they get rid of them and they sell the stuff off the ships that they have stolen sometimes they will hold the ship ransom not good it still happens uh, just not that part of the world that's in the story where it's happening here but over on the other side of Africa um, in the Indian Ocean right who would have thought we're having a children's book and here we are having a discussion on true piracy after they had taken the people off they would sink the ship and sail back to Barbary singing songs and feeling proud of the mischief that they had done then they used to make the people they had caught write home to their friends for money and if the friends sent no money the pir pirates often threw the people into the sea sounds familiar I don't know where he was getting his news headlines from but it's real now one sunshiny day the doctor and Dab Dab were walking up and down on the ship for exercise a nice fresh wind was blowing the boat along and everybody was happy presently Dab Dab saw the sail of another ship a long way behind them on the edge of the sea in other words way over on the horizon it was a red sail I don't like the look of that sail said Dab Dab I have a feeling it isn't a friendly ship I am afraid there is more trouble coming to us oh dear oh dear oh dear oh dear oh dear oh no what's going to happen Jip who was lying near taking a nap in the Sun began to growl and talk in his sleep I smell roast beef cooking he mumbled underdone roast beef with brown gravy over it said Jip the dog good gracious cried the doctor what's the matter with the dog is he smelling in his sleep as well as talking I suppose he is said Dab Dab all dogs can smell in their sleep but what is he smelling asked the doctor there is no beef, roast beef cooking on our ship no said Dab Dab the roast beef must be on that ship over there but that's ten miles away said the doctor he couldn't smell that far surely oh yes he could said Dab Dab you ask him then Jip still fast asleep began to growl again and his lips his lip curled up angrily showing his clean white teeth but when a dog pulls its lip up to growl at you but it's serious just step back get out of the way I smell bad men he growled the worst men I ever smelt I smell trouble I smell a fight six bad scoundrels fighting against one brave man I want to help him woof 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 then he barked loud and woke himself up with a surprised look on his face see said Dab Dab that boat is nearer now you can count its three big sails all red whoever it is they are coming after us I wonder who they are hmm 
They are bad sailors, said Jip, and their ship is very swift. They are surely the pirates of Barbary. I think when he said bad, he meant not that their quality of sailing was bad, but they were bad men who are sailors. Well, we must put up more sails on our boat, said the doctor, so we can go faster and get away from them. Run downstairs, Jip, and fetch me all the sails you see. The dog hurried downstairs and dragged up every sail he could find. And yes, I do have an illustration here to show you. Is the doctor looking out at the ship in the distance, way over on the horizon, and there's Dab Dab the duck and Jip the dog watching. And by the way, this little thing here that looks like two fingers like that, or thumbs like that, is a fair lead. It's a place that you put a rope through to keep it in line. Sometimes a fair lead is a hole where you have a mooring rope through, and sometimes a fair lead is just on a top rail on a ship, and they drop the, the rope in between those two fingers, and then it stays hooked in on one side or the other. It's genuine. They really do have them like that there. So I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed that he's actually put that level of detail in. But even... <sighs> Sorry. The dog hurried downstairs and dragged up every sail he could find. But even when all these were put up on the masts to catch the wind, the boat did not go nearly as fast as the pirates, which kept coming on behind, closer and closer. This is a poor ship the prince gave us, said Gub Gub the pig. The slowest he could find, I should think. Might as well try to win a race in a soup terrine as hope to get away from them in this old barge. Look how near they are now. You can see the moustaches on the faces of the men. Six of them. What are we going to do? Then the doctor asked Dab Dab to fly up and tell the swallows that the pirates were coming after them in a swift ship. And what should he do about it? That's an interesting thought. When the swallows heard this, they all came down to the doctor's ship and they told him to unravel some long pieces, some pieces of long rope and make them into a lot of thin strings as quickly as he could. So that's where you take the rope and you twist it the wrong way and it unravels. And so it makes it into a whole lot more pieces, but they're a lot thinner. That's what he's, the, the birds are asking him to do. Um, make them into a lot of thin strings as quickly as he could. Then the ends of these strings were tied onto the front of the ship and the swallows took hold of the strings with their feet and flew off, pulling the boat along. That's a lot of string. And although the swallows are not very strong when only one or two are by themselves, it is different when there are a great lot of them together. And there, tied to the doctor's ship, were a thousand strings and 2,000 swallows were pulling on each string, all terribly swift flyers. And in a moment, the doctor found himself traveling so fast, he had to hold his hat on with both hands, for he felt as though the ship itself were flying through the waves that frothed and boiled with speed. And all the animals on the ship began to laugh and dance about in the rushing air, for when they looked back at the pirate's ship, they could see that it was growing smaller now instead of bigger. The red sails were being left far, far behind. And that's the end of that chapter. And I would say that the chapter was called Red Sails and Blue Sails. I think that's what it was called. I'm just going back to it. Uh, red Sails and Blue Wings. That's what it was. It's the swallows having blue wings. And that's the end of that chapter. And I'm actually going to stop there today because I have plenty of things I have to go and do that around the house, like preparing a meal for the rest of the family and myself, which would be a little bit disappointing to not do. So let's just have a little chat instead before I go, um, rather than reading the next chapter. I will give you a hint, though. The next chapter is called The Rat's Warning. What do you know about rats and ships that might be a warning? Hmm, that's a little bit worrying. Yes, indeed. It's a little bit worrying. Ah, <sighs> but that's the way it is, isn't it? I'm just checking to see if there's anything else I need to be doing over there. 
Right. Tags. Hmm. I'm thinking about the tags for my stream. Reading aloud, neurodivergent, that means I'm autistic and I have ADHD. There's a whole lot of other things that come under neurodivergent. New Zealand, because that's the country I'm in. Cozy, family friendly, codex, because that's the reader's team that I'm part of. And Kiwi, because Kiwis identify each other as Kiwis. Kiwi is a New Zealander. Um, and we call ourselves that after the bird, which is our national emblem. Actually, I'll show you a picture of a Kiwi, just in case you haven't seen one before. Kiwi. Not the fruit. The fruit are named after the birds and the people, rather than the... Um, Birds and the people being named after the fruit. They are a nocturnal bird. That means they're a bird that comes out at night. Let's find a good picture of one. one looks like a good idea. This is, for, this is a particular variety of kiwi. that We, we have several varieties of them. Uh, New Zealand birds, native birds, we have a lot of birds in New Zealand. We have a very high number of our native birds, that's our birds that are specific to our country, that are flightless because before the Māori arrived and before the Europeans arrived, we had no native land mammals to prey on our birds. And so therefore the birds were relatively safe. Here is a kiwi bird. Um, they're quite rounded. They have this neck here and they have a long, long, long beak. And they poke their beak into the ground, push it into the ground, and they are looking for worms to eat and bugs, grubs. Um, they've got strong legs and feet, and they, their feathers are not smooth feathers like a lot of other bird feathers. They are a thin feather that has the fibres on the edges of it um, kind of stick out a little bit fluffy, and they used to be used for Maori um, cloaks as part of the ceremonial costume that, that the chiefs would wear. Um, but they are not a daytime bird. They come out at night and they are very, very shy. And a lot of us Kiwi kids, especially in my particular part of the country, have strong memories of going to the Auckland Zoo and visiting the Kiwi house there, which was a building which has a glassed off area where there are Kiwis. There are a family of Kiwi living there in behind this glass and you can hear them through the speakers and it's you go into this building because you can't see them outside in daytime. So this building is kept so that it is dark during the day. It's like it's nighttime and it's got real trees and plants growing there. And these birds are walking around in the dark, fairly dark, poking their beaks into the ground. The other thing that's really unusual with the Kiwis, they do actually have a wing stub. Like technically they have a wing, but it's not big enough for them to be able to fly with. It's just a little tiny, it would be on there would probably be, trying to put my hand the right way, it would probably be about, which finger am I put it, putting where? The, the wing would probably be about, <laughs> very rotund, okay, about as long as my finger is there, <laughs> except that way, and um, further away. So they're not very long wings, and they don't have the sort of feathers that will, will knit together with the edges. A normal feather has a spine up the middle, and then it has fluffy bits that come down each side. And each of these fluffy bits has a little microscopic hook on it that hooks onto the, the, the next little piece of fluffy bit that pokes out from it. This is not the soft down feathers. This is normal flying feathers. Kiwis do not have those sort of feathers. And so therefore, because of that, they don't have feathers that will um, cup against the wind for a bird to be able to push down against the air to get the pressure which will help them to fly and they're also a heavier bird um, but aside from being nocturnal and aside from being flightless because they are absolutely genuinely flightless not preferring not to fly but they cannot fly 
Aside from that, their beak is what is so unique because they have their nostrils down at the end of the tip of their beak. So down here is where their nostrils are. Other birds have their nostrils up here across the top of their, their nose, the beak. And there's usually a soft fleshy bit just in the, at the top of a bird's beak and it has two little um, holes in it. Uh, if you look at a, a budgerigar, a budgie, or a parrot or anything like that, you can see the, the nostrils up there. Well, a, a kiwi has it right down at the very tip of its beak there, way, way, way down here. Um, and it's because they are using their beak to help them to find these worms down under the ground to eat. Um, <laughs> yes, well done on the puzzle. A fundraiser to get some good flying wings. I don't know that they would take up the offer. Then reluctant to change um, they're also but because they are flightless they are very very vulnerable um, and thank you for doing the puzzle I do appreciate that <sighs> I just sort of thought it was the sort of thing that you might enjoy seeing um, that sort of a picture of a tropical night when they when the, they were escaping from um, the the king and his prison and the kitchen with all the scrubbing that, that the doctor was going to have to do um, so yeah, that's a kiwi. Because they're flightless, they are quite vulnerable. They can't climb easily up into trees. They live in hollows in the ground or underneath trees, things like that. And even though they are, the, the, the main body of a kiwi is probably about this big. And they have lungs, their lungs are just underneath the ribs, which are on, are on the top upper edge of their body. And dogs, if they find them, will often go to pick them up by picking by putting their mouth around them. Now, even the kiwi fruit was named after the bird, not the bird after the fruit. The kiwi fruit was a much later development. Um, even if a dog is intending to be gentle, because they have canine teeth, the big teeth here, those teeth will go through the thin skin of the bird. Um, underneath the feathers and it will puncture their lungs and so they actually die very very easily if a dog even if the dog is trying to be gentle if the dog picks it up it will often kill the bird um, and they don't really have a lot of defenses either um, I'm just wondering this one is just trying to see if I can find one in someone's hands so you can see how how the sort of scale of what they are It's a bit hard to find because they're not an animal that you often get to see up close as a person just because they are trying to be protective of them. This one's probably the best one. Save that image and show it to you. To change the format of that one, I think. Oh, there goes a boy racer up the road going zzz in his car. Very noisy. Save as JPEG. No, not in that folder. Nearly there. Right. Interesting facts about kiwis. That's the name of the page that it was on. I just did an image search. The only reason I'm saying that is so I can find it in the folder because they're sorted alphabetically. So here, here you go. Um, there's a kiwi being held by an adult. This is probably one of the Department of Conservation workers, dock workers. Um, so that's the size of the hands. If I bring my hand up closer, you can see a similar size. You can see, if my hand is about there, you can see as a hand, yeah, yeah, good, good size hand for it. That means the beak is at least that long, not up to my face, but holding my fingers like this, you can see how long the beak is. They are quite a vulnerable bird. Um, they, like I say, they are nocturnal, which is why this one is looking uncomfortable. It's out during daytime. It's probably been pulled out of its nest, checked, making sure it's healthy. They do health checks on the, on the ones that they know about to make sure that they are surviving, that they are thriving. Um, 
We do actually have a captive uh, breeding program in New Zealand, Auckland Zoo, which is the zoo that's nearest to where I live. Actually, that's part of one of their jobs is that they they spend a lot of time looking after rescued uh, native birds, but also um, they have pairs of multiple pairs of different birds that are an endangered, seriously endangered, and they will actually look after them, make sure that they are healthy enough that they can breed and raise, um, hatch out the eggs and raise the eggs. Um, and then they'll release them out into the wild when when the, the young ones are strong enough and have the skills. They do try to keep them socialised with, with their own kind rather than with people, although they do, they do have a little bit of hand training so that if they do need to check up on them when they're in the wild, um, because they're often put into places that are safe places like particular um, pest eradicated preserves where it's completely uh, an, an area of land that has been completely cut off with a, a specialised fencing system so you don't have rats there because the rats will often eat young birds um, and eggs, um, not just of kiwi but of other birds too. And the, the rats will climb up into trees to get to nests of birds that are uh, tree nesting birds and eat the young that, that way too. So they will eliminate the rats from those sort of reserves, those sort of parks. Uh, and if you go in to visit, you can't take a dog with you, even if you have an assistance dog, unless you have a very special permission and you probably have somebody from their staff accompanying you to make sure the dog stays under full control at all time because you, your, your average dog is not trained for looking after a, a kiwi safely. People do have dogs that are trained for it, which means that they have a dog that is trained not to try and hold the bird, not to try and pick it up, even if it's being helpful. Um, and some of them also, if they're working with the rangers to, to look for birds, to find out if there's, there's any in a new area or something like that, they will have them muzzled, but they will be trained to the scent, of the, the type of smell that these birds have, so that the dogs can help the rangers to find the birds. Uh, all that sort of stuff. So we have a lot of endangered birds in New Zealand because of the fact that we did we had such a long history without humans being here, without land-based mammals, and so therefore our birds adapted to the living situation, which meant that some of them nest in trees, but some of them nest on the ground. There are a lot of birds that we have that are, on average, chunkier than what most birds are, and so therefore... They can fly, but they don't fly unless they absolutely have to, just because that's the way life was for them for hundreds and thousands of years. Um, so kiwi are endangered. Uh, there are a lot of other ones that are too, but we've got some really intriguing ones. There's a, a particular variety that for a long time were listed as endangered, but um, because they were protected for so long and they breed really well, this particular variety. I'll just see if I can find one. Um, a quite a striking looking bird. Uh, this particular sort of bird uh, is called a pukeko. Uh, a lot of these sort of birds are, actually have their New Zealand native names. Um, I'm trying to find you a picture of it. Now, the the other name for it, the non-Māori name for it, although most of us know it as a pukeko in New Zealand, the non-Māori name for it is swamp hen. They like swampy lands. So I'm just going to find you the picture for that one. Here's the pukeko. So this one here, we don't have highly coloured. We have strikingly coloured, but we don't have really sort of like buzzy, wow. Um, psychedelic birds. So this is a pukeko. They've got very strong legs. There are a lot longer legs than a kiwi. They have a very short feet compared with them. These ones, you see them wandering around on our front lawn sometimes. They were protected for long enough that they thrive now. Um, there's enough wetlands and, and boggy bits. We've got a couple of ponds down in the, the park next to us and so they, they nest in amongst the, the, the marshy bits around the edge and the rushes and things like this and under the flax bushes. The New Zealand flax bushes. Um, but these ones, when they've decided that they want to come and have a look at your front lawn for food, they will wander around and they will, with this very strong beak, they will pull up these bits of grass so that they can get to, and they will, they'll hold it like this, they'll be pulling, 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 um, and pull it out so that they can get to the soft, fresh, new shoots coming out at the tips of the grass or around the roots. And so 
they will then, you'll see them, it'll look like they've got something wrong with their leg or their foot, but what they'll do is they'll actually then put that piece of grass in between their toes, like down here, and you'll see them lift up one foot and then they'll be nibbling at this piece of grass that's between their toes. And so you'll see them standing there on one foot and it's like they're nursing their foot. No, they're not. They're actually just holding onto the grass roots so they can nibble at them. Um, yeah, I think the dodo would have actually fitted in quite well over here. It's another one of those chunky birds. So this one here is now very common to the point where farmers can't stand them. <laughs> Because if you've got other birds that you're trying to encourage, these ones can take over a bit just because they breed relatively easily and things like that. Um, and they can make a bit of a mess around the ponds and things like that. Now, one of the joking things that happens around here is that, where I live, we have an island just down the way from us, halfway between me and the centre of the big city, and it is a bird sanctuary. I'm just trying to find this one. They have a particular bird there was, that was thought to be extinct. And when you see the picture, <laughs> you'll see. Sorry, I'm amused by this particular bird. It's always amused me. So it was thought to be extinct just because there were so few of them. It's not as they've, they've managed to find them, they've managed to restore them, blah, blah, blah. This one here, we jokingly in the family refer to as, as yeah, not as bad as Canada geese for just being there and being in the way and making a mess. Um, this one here is a takahe. The family joke about a takahe being a pukeko on steroids. They are just that much chunkier. They are a really, really solid bird. The beak is very similar, but it's more solid this way. The body is just like Ugh! you wouldn't want to get thumped into by one of these now you, they used to be very shy birds when they were actually still just living in the wild they have been rescued they are no longer as endangered as they were but they are still endangered but they live on this island and the island is a bird sanctuary and the birds there know they are safe there is major trouble if anyone does any damage to any of the birds on this island these ones live here live on that island and they will walk right up to you and you have to get out of their way. And you wouldn't want one to bump into you. So the main body of a takahe is about this big. The main body of a pukeko is about this big. And the pukeko has longer legs. So the legs on a pukeko would come up to about here if you stood the two side by side. Yeah, they are just, and they look like they're a bit grumpy too. Um, so these ones here, I don't think these ones fly, but the pukeko can they just are a little bit more reluctant because they're also, they would have to work pretty hard. But we have so many birds, different varieties of birds that are specific to New Zealand that are not elsewhere overseas. Um, just because that's the place that we are. And it's wonderful. We love them. Um, we do have a lot of European birds as well, like sparrows and thrushes and blackbirds and magpies and miners which are originally from India and were imported to pick at the ticks on the back of cattle and things like that and as is typical for a lot of things if you import it into New Zealand it can thrive that they things usually thrive and then compete with the stuff that lives here naturally and it can make life a little bit difficult for the native birds so we have another bird that's called a tui, um, that's another Māori name, and it's like this, this black bird that has that shine on it that black birds have. Um, black bird, the variety of bird that's called a black bird. But they have this lovely warbling song, and, it's, and, and they can mimic. They are, they're black and shiny, and then they have this cluster of white feathers at their throat. One of their nicknames in the early days was a parson bird, so it was like... Um, the old parsons in England would have a, a black curate's or a priest's robe with a white collar, and so it was called a parson bird, but everyone just calls them tui now. They are tuis, and they are nectar eaters. So all these different things. Anyway, so and that, there you go. There's your science lesson for today, I suppose. Geography lesson. Um, uh, yeah, and they mimic voices. There are other birds that do too, like my, uh, magpies mimic voices. Magpies, especially the ones that live in Australia, 
but also if they're living in New Zealand, they will often be brand mimics. But that's it for today. That's enough of me telling you all about my um, local wildlife and things like that. Um, and I'm thinking, what about we go and see if we can raid somebody, and I will actually do my regular thing that I'm going to say first. Ooh, yay, we've got one of our readers is currently live. Gentle Fox ASMR is currently live. We can raid him. Please follow him. If you can spare it, subscribe to his channel as well. All those things. He's a great reader. He he's, reads under the classification of ASMR as opposed to reading fun because he has this gentle voice and he's just like, oh, it's goosebumps. Um, but he also sometimes does other stuff with other readers um, that are not specifically um, Codex readers. Anyway, so I'll just say thank you for so much for being here. It's been great having you here and also learning about more, more to do with New Zealand and other overseas places. Um, Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for being here. And in the meantime, happy reading.